On September 28, 2020, with only 31 seconds to go, SpaceX scrubbed their 13th Starlink launch yet again, this time due to weather not being quite good enough to launch at the exact time the Falcon 9 needed to launch. In stage are pressurizing for launch. Hold, hold, hold. This is a Starlink L12 scrub due to weather violations. Prepping for a launch is a very expensive procedure, obviously. Most rocket companies therefore have launch windows of minutes to hours. So why does SpaceX have instantaneous launch windows and what can they do to increase this time if they wanted to? Hey y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. This channel is dedicated to finding out whether I really do know it all or not. If you enjoyed the episode, definitely make sure you subscribe and definitely make sure you ask me questions in the comments or at my email address. Also, if you don't know and you're watching this before October 10th of 2020, please be sure to check out this video. We've got a 500 subscriber giveaway going on right now so you can enter it and you can be entered to get a copy of <laughs> the Atlas Obscura, right there. So definitely enter if you'd like a copy of that book. It's super, super cool. So what is a launch window? A launch window for rocket ships is a window of time during which a spacecraft can launch. So that could be anywhere from instantaneous, which is basically what it sounds like. It has to launch at exactly that second up to multiple hours that the rocket could launch. There are a lot of factors that are involved in this and SpaceX adds one more wrinkle to it, which is why they're really, really restricted to instantaneous launch windows. So some of the reasons could be the alignment with an objective. For example, if you're launching to the International Space Station, you have to hit you have to launch at the exact moment, not when they're passing overhead, of course, because you have to catch up with them and everything, but you have to launch at a time that aligns you with their orbit so that six hours later or 24 hours later or whenever you need to match up with them, your orbit is going to match up with them. It's rocket science. It's not, it's not easy to explain. There's a lot of calculations involved. But basically, when you calculate that, it has to be done at that exact time or very, very close to that exact time with slightly different delta Vs. And then, of course, you have to have a margin of safety, especially for human rated flights, so that you've got to have a little extra fuel involved. So that's definitely one thing. There's also range clearance. So you have to downrange, which means not just at the takeoff location like Cape Canaveral, Florida, but all the way throughout the Atlantic Ocean, really, I think up to like Ireland, you have to make sure that there is a range clearance because kind of the, the rockets, for the most part, kind of tail up the U.S. East Coast for a long time before they kind of head out. And so, and that's especially true for human rated space flight because they need to bail out someplace close to shore. But even with other ones, they have to have range clearance for hundreds of miles or kilometers around the launch area to make sure if something bad were to happen that no, you know, <laughs> there's not a fishing boat or an oil tanker or something like that that's just hanging out right underneath. And then of course there's, there's the kind of mundane aspect of work schedules. You've got a crew that's working on the ground, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people that have to all be working during that period of time. So your launch window can be limited by the fact that you need to do that in the middle of people's work shifts. You don't want to like launch and have your window cross over when one shift would end and another shift would begin, right? So you want it to be centered into that. So maybe if you've got an eight hour shift or something, you want to put your launch window in the middle couple of hours if you can. As might be obvious from this, however, these windows can extend over quite a time, right? Minutes to hours. And computers can adjust to changing alignment with new courses. All of that can be pre-programmed. Essentially, there can be a new program for every couple of seconds uh, that take place. So you can extend these launch windows for quite a bit of time. And of course, you know, ranges can be kept clear for a period of time, not infinitely, but you can definitely keep them clear. And the work schedule can be worked around, right? <laughs> you set the launch window so that it overlaps the crew's central hours of working. So what is the new wrinkle that SpaceX adds? Well, what they have is they have ultra cryogenic fuel. Um, basically, they're using liquid oxygen and RP-1. RP-1 is a room temperature gas, right? It's, I mean, it's gasoline. <laughs> it's like super refined gasoline. So it is liquid at room temperature. It's fine. But liquid oxygen is liquid. Let me just look this up. Liquid oxygen boils or becomes liquid. The transition is at negative 183 degrees centigrade. More importantly, at 200, negative 219 degrees centigrade is when LOX freezes. So while most spacecraft are launched with the liquid oxygen 
at close to boiling point, so around negative 183 centigrade, SpaceX actually chills it down until it's basically a slush. It's really, really close to its freezing point. And as opposed to water, which, you know, it gets smaller, but then it expands and turns into ice cubes, you know, which floats, liquid oxygen, as with most other liquids, actually continues to shrink until it solidifies. So you can fit a lot more liquid oxygen into the tanks if they're much colder, if they're nearer to that negative 219 degrees centigrade rather than the negative 183 degrees centigrade. So that's basically the bonus they get. They get a lot of extra specific impulse. They get a lot of extra efficiency out of their engines and they can launch more to orbit with the same rocket basically. But the consequence of that is that they have to hit it, right? You're loading your oxygen in and it's at a very low temperature, but all it wants to do is boil off because the outside world is way, way, way hotter than it is. So it's trying to boil off. So basically they're feeding it, they're feeding it, they're feeding it. They get to exactly the right moment and they have to take off during that moment. If they don't, it starts to expand and to boil off and therefore they're stuck, right? So they basically have like a one second or instantaneous launch window. In addition, colder liquid oxygen is colder. <laughs> so therefore it increases the engine efficiency as well because you're expanding a colder liquid into a the same temperature hot gas. So there's more expansion, which causes everything to work more efficiently. Uh, effectively, the early Falcon 9s, and I had, to, I had to dig for this a little bit, but I think I've got these numbers right. These are the sea level engines, not the vacuum engines. But the specific impulse went from 282 seconds for early Falcon 9 iterations to 310 seconds with current Block 5 ones. A specific impulse is just don't worry about exactly what it is, but the bigger the number, the better the rocket is, right? It can go longer on the same amount of fuel. That's basically what it's saying. So this is a 9% increase in efficiency. Some of this is due to better engine design over time, but a lot of it is from the ultra cryogenic liquid oxygen propellant. So you may think like 9% is no big deal, but remember we're talking about rockets. Every single like gram <laughs> that you can expend in a more efficient way is more weight that you can get to orbit. So this is a massive increase in terms of the rocketry and the efficiency, but it comes at a cost. And the cost is that you have to get that fuel at the right temperature, it's super, super cold, and it only stays there for a very brief amount of time before it starts to heat up again and boil off. So basically you have to nail that window. So you have essentially a one second or instantaneous launch window because you're pumping in ultra cryogenic fuel and then as soon as you stop doing that, it's heating up, right? So it's immediately expanding to try to reach the uh, <laughs> gaseous state of the universe around it. So if that doesn't happen, they have to scrub and they have to try again another day. So the way that SpaceX fuels their rockets actually had a huge impact on a crewed flight. They had to fight with NASA for years about this because traditionally what NASA does is they fuel the vehicle before the crew arrives. So it's basically almost fueled and pressurized before the f crew gets there and gets on board. NASA deemed this to be a much safer way to go. With the Falcon, the crew arrives, they get into their spacecraft, and then the craft is fueled. It took many years and a lot of effort to get NASA to allow this change in format as there's a certain amount of safety to fueling first. Although honestly, in my mind, if you've got a craft with an enabled abort system working on it, I actually think it's safer to fuel it afterwards, right? You're not like taking an elevator and getting on board something that's a, effectively a bomb. It's empty at the time. So once you're up there, you've got your you've got your abort system in place and you could, if something went wrong, just, just take off and get out of there. So I think honestly, it's safer to do it this way, but NASA had always done it the other way. So it took SpaceX years to get them to agree to letting them do this. So once again, the downside to this marvelous increase in efficiency is the fact that even if a few clouds go by or if there's a little high level wind or something and it gets in the way of that exact second and 10 minutes later, it would have been able to launch. You can't do it. Uh, there was crewed launches. I think it was the second attempt to launch the crew demo mission one, the first human rated flight that went up and they had to cancel because of weather. And the people in charge were like, if we just had 10 more minutes, it would be fine, but we don't. And so people, I think, asked that question. They were like, well, why didn't you have 10 more minutes? Well, this is why. It comes down to the fueling and the way that the fuel is exactly timed to be at the right temperature at the right time. Is there a way to fix this? Well, yes, with uncrewed flights, at least there should be. And actually it turns out that there is on the books, although I've never seen it actually happen. If anybody actually has, please do let me know in the comments. I would be very curious to find out if this has ever happened in real life. 
So the solution is to do a partial scrub. So effectively what you would do, and this, this is not true for crewed missions because it's too dangerous, but you would detank the liquid oxygen immediately after the scrub. So let's say you got down to a minute. You, you then unpressurize the liquid oxygen and then you refill it. It turns out this cycle time takes about 90 minutes to do, so it's not a fast procedure but it is possible. Um, again, I have never heard of SpaceX actually doing this, although apparently when I was doing research for this, it is on the books to do so. The advantage of this, of course, is that it would save a lot of money versus fully depressurizing and detanking everything and then sending the crew home and then having them all come back and check out everything the next day or two days later or something like that. It seems like that would be a, a much more efficient and a cost-saving thing. Given the fact that SpaceX doesn't do this, there must be a reason why, and it must not be quite as economically efficient as it seems to me. Of course, even an uncrewed launch to something like the International Space Station necessitates those instantaneous launch windows, but that's true for any rocket company. So that means they have to launch at the right time, and it's a very precise moment, or else everything's not. <laughs> the stars are not in alignment for everything to work out when they need to dock uh, several hours later. At any rate, this need to reset for a different day entirely is a very expensive and inefficient effect of going with the kind of slushy O2 that you get. But on the other hand, SpaceX is able to do this at a very, very low cost because of the fact that they're reusing their boosters. So, you know, it seems to balance out. They're definitely in the lead in terms of cost per kilogram to space right now. So, you know, whatever they're doing seems to work right. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA, go NASA, go SpaceX, Godspeed, Bob and Doug. I hope you found this episode enjoyable and a little bit educational if you didn't know about instantaneous launch windows and stuff. If you did enjoy the video, definitely make sure you like and subscribe. And also, if it's before October 10th, make sure you check out the other video so that you can be involved in our 500 subscriber giveaway. And certainly ask me questions in the comments or at my email address, which is drknowitallknows at gmail.com. Till next time, bye-bye. <laughs>